I am a big football fan, and uh, my team played their big rival yesterday, and uh, they played 117 times over about a 120 year span. There were a few years they didn't play. And I began the game with a lot of hope. And it, which, which I think a good definition of hope that I found is a desire accompanied by expectation of a, or, or belief in fulfillment of that hope. And my hope or desire was that my team would win, of course. <clears throat> my hope was centered on the coach, the quarterback, some of their key players, and they were my hope for victory. But at some point in the second half of the game, I started losing hope. And by the end of the game, my, uh, my hope in a victory was gone. My team lost, right? <clears throat> and uh, we're going to talk about hope today. Hope is the looking forward to something, reason. It's a verb. We use hope as a verb a lot, right? I hope. We, we hope. You hope. But it's also this looking forward is a noun. The fact of this looking forward, that is hope. Hope, hope is, is a noun. And hope is also the thing that you are hoping for. The, the thing that you're expecting. My hope was a victory yesterday. <clears throat> um, it's then also the basis of that expectation. What is the basis of our hope? And that itself is our hope. You know that old line? One of the most famous lines. I don't quote Star Wars a lot, but Princess Leia was her, one of those famous lines. Help me, Obi-Wan. You're my only hope. <clears throat> she, uh, she looked to him as her hope. The one who was the basis of something good that could happen in the future for her. We put our hope in a lot of things. We put our hope in sports teams to win. We put our hope in investments to make money. We put our hope in a promotion at work. Before we get married, we're looking for that boyfriend or girlfriend, and we put our hope in relationships that hopefully will one day end up in marriage that will be the one that we spend our lives with. And sometimes our teams win. Sometimes our investments pan out, and sometimes hard work does pay off, and we get promotions. And sometimes we do find that person to spend our life with. But because the world is under the effect of the fall, because of the curse of sin, our hopes are often left unfulfilled. <clears throat> Teams lose. Investments also can plummet or depreciate over time. Sometimes we get discouraged over our career or a lack of growth or not moving forward like we want it to go. Sometimes relationships end before we're ready for them to end, when we don't want them to end. In short, when we hope in the world, eventually we will be let down. So I brought you here to discourage you this morning. <laughs> Bring this down, Pastor. But it's really true, isn't it? When we, hope our, when we put our hope in the world, when we put our hope in something like people or circumstances or investments or relationships or friendships or an experience or a circumstance, we can be let down. We can be disappointed. But as we look here in this first week of Advent, I'm not going to leave you down there. <laughs> I'm going to pick you up and help you to see the true hope that we have in life. As we prepare for the advent of Jesus Christ's birth and we celebrate that, we are going to focus on hope today. Hope that lasts. Hope that counts. Hope that is worth waiting for. Our passage today is 1 Peter 1, 1 through 21. So go ahead and turn there. 1 Peter Almost to the end of your Bibles. If you go back from Revelation, you'll hit Jude and John's, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, 2nd Peter, and then 1st Peter. <clears throat> we're in 1st Peter 1. We're going to read verses 1 through 21. And as we read this, I want you to be thinking about these three aspects of hope that I brought up 
earlier. What do we look forward to? What do we look forward? What is our reason or our basis for looking forward to it? And how do we continue to do that? How do we continue to look forward in hope? How do we continue to have hope? So as we read this, if you're able to stand, let's stand in honor of God's word. This is God's inspired word. 1 Peter 1, 1 through 21. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that's imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you've not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that's inexpressible, filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you, in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which the angels long to look. Therefore, preparing your minds for action, be sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you're also to be holy in your conduct. Since it's written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as a father, as father who judges impartially according to one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the future ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. So I know it's kind of a long passage, but this is, if you remember the beginning of it, it starts in hope and it ends in hope, and then there's hope in the middle. Just a great passage about hope that we have. So when I answer those three questions, the first question was, to what do we look forward? Let's look back at verses 3 through 9, because this really encapsulates or summarizes the hope that we have, that we're looking forward to. In verse, in verse 4, it says, we're looking forward to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you an inheritance an inheritance that is imperishable all of our inheritances at some point will dissipate they'll either be spent or if it's a building it eventually is going to be worn out you know the inheritance that was given thousands of years ago from father to son or from family to the next family most of that's gone their buildings their inheritance their wealth maybe the land is still around But even that will fade away at one time. But we have an inheritance that is imperishable, 
That will never go away. That will never dissolve. That's undefiled, unfading, and kept in heaven for you. Jesus mentioned this inheritance a few times in the Gospels. John 14, 1, Jesus said this, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself that where I am, you may also be. That was in the upper room discourse. He's telling the disciples right before he was to be killed. I go, I'm going ahead. I'm preparing a place for you. A place for you, an inheritance. There'll be a new heaven and a new kingdom. And a new earth. And I don't know exactly how that's going to work out. If you have it all figured out, write a book. Sell, 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 sell a bunch of copies. I don't think any of us have it all figured out exactly what it's going to look like. But I do know this. If you're in Christ, you have an inheritance. In some way, Christ is preparing a place for you. Uh, an eternal home for you. A home that you never have to worry about the water heater or pipes breaking or blowing out your sprinklers because this home is imperishable and this home, this inheritance will never end and it's undefiled and it's perfect and it's kept for you. It's your inheritance in Jesus Christ. Matthew 19, 29 says, And everyone who's left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake, Jesus says, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. Another part of our inheritance is eternal life. And that eternal life doesn't just start when you die, that you get this life. No, it's the Holy Spirit in you. God's life, eternal life, in you as a believer in Jesus Christ. <clears throat> if you are in Christ, you have inherited eternal life. You have an inheritance waiting for you as well in the new kingdom. Matthew 25, 34 says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Jesus, God the Father purposed it. God the Son provided for us. And the Holy Spirit is the power. He's bringing in, he's ushering in a new kingdom. If you're in Christ, you're inheriting a position, a place somehow, some way in that kingdom. That's exciting. You have in, inherited eternal life, a kingdom and a place that he has prepared before you. So Peter says, hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, to this inheritance. Our hope is always in the future. Hope is never looking back. Hope always looks forward to something in the future. And what we have to hope about in the future is this inheritance. The inheritance of eternal life, the inheritance of a place and inheritance and a position in God's kingdom. In verse 5, continuing on in 1 Peter, who by God's power, talking about us, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. <clears throat> salvation that will be revealed when Christ returns. Now, we have salvation. If you're in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are a son, a child of the king. It says you've been adopted into the family. You move from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. So you have salvation. But that salvation is going to be um, fully understood, fully received, fully seen when Christ returns again. There's more to come. There's more to come. It will mature fully when Christ comes. The salvation of our soul is coming. It is here now. You may have heard this phrase already. Already, but not yet. You already are saved, but not yet are you fully experiencing the salvation of Jesus Christ when he comes. And that is our hope. The resurrection is our hope. Now, when we talk about the resurrection, some of us may be alive. 
when Jesus comes back. Some of us may not. And those who are in Christ and who have died are resurrected. That is our hope. And when you preach a, a sermon at a, at a funeral, the only hope that you can offer is the hope of the resurrection. That this person who died, if they were in Christ, that they will be resurrected to new life, to be with Christ forever and ever. So the resurrection of the dead is our hope. You know, yes, I hope that Christ comes back while I'm still alive and don't have to go through that. But I know my hope in the future is that if I do pass away before he comes, is that the resurrection will occur. And how do I know that? Because I know that Jesus was resurrected from the grave. He was resurrected and he rose again in power and he declared that he is the Son of God. And when he did that, he did that for our sake so that we knew, so we saw that he had conquered sin and conquered death. And he conquered death and sin and he encouraged the believers that followed him, the disciples. And that gave them hope in the resurrection for themselves. He is the first fruits of the resurrection. And we will be like Christ. When we die and we are resurrected, we will have a glorified body, a resurrection body. One of my favorite pastors said, we look like Walter Payton, all the guys. We'll, we'll have that body, it'll be perfect. And we'll have that, you know, 2% body fat, cut, ripped, you know, perfect shape. And that's what we'll look like. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if that's the case. But I do know that we'll have a resurrection body that will be renewed, that will be strengthened. And that that's our hope. That life just doesn't end with this existence. That, you know, when we have struggles and toils and troubles, that we have a hope beyond the grave. The resurrection. So our hope is the resurrection of the dead when Christ returns. Our hope is an inheritance, this, this position in the kingdom, this place that Christ has made for us, and this eternal life that's in us, that we've inherited. And third, the salvation of our souls that is finalized and complete, completed when Christ returns. That's what we're looking forward to. That is our hope. That's the object of our hope as a Christian. The resurrection, our inheritance, and the salvation. That comes through Jesus Christ. Well, what is our reason? What's the basis for this hope? What's our reason for looking forward to it? Look forward to verse 10 with me. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person be that what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. The prophets of God were told the Word of God. They wrote down the Word of God, and as they're writing it, they're thinking to themselves, wow, the Christ is coming. This is amazing, the Messiah. When is he coming? And I wonder what it's going to be like, and I wonder what that's going to be like. But it was looking forward. They, really, they knew that it wasn't for them. They knew that they were writing the words of the Old Testament of these prophecies for you, for me, for other people. It was revealed to them they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Do you get what he's saying there? This is so cool. This is so amazing that the angels are in heaven looking at this going, God, this grace thing that you're working out through Jesus, the Savior that's going to come, the Messiah, the Christ that you're planning, that you wrote down here. Wow. I wonder what that feels like to be separated from God, to be in sin, and then to have God's grace. Open your eyes, open your heart to the truth of the gospel, to receive Jesus as a Savior, to be adopted in as a son of God, to be brought into the family, to be given forgiveness, to be given an inheritance, to be given a place in the kingdom. Wow. It says angels are sitting in heaven, looking over the edge of heaven, down into earth going, wow, that is cool. Wonder what that feels like. What is our reason for looking forward? One is the trustworthiness of God's word. The trustworthiness of God's word. How can we have hope? We know what we have hope in. The resurrection, inheritance, salvation. 
What's the basis for that? God's word. Romans 5, 4 says this. <clears throat> Whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction. That through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. We might have hope. Why did God write all the things in the Old Testament? Why did he take the, the, the pains of putting it together, of preserving it, of his word being handed down, <clears throat> of all the people that came and were persecuted and endured? Why do we have God's word now? It's so that we can have hope. So that as we look back at what God said, and we look at what he's done so far, that we have hope on the basis of God's word, which has not failed yet and never will fail. I think you know 2 Timothy 3.16 by heart, most many of you. But it says, All scripture is breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be com competent, equipped for every good work. This is God's word, and it's here so that we might have hope, that the encouragement of the scriptures might give us hope. <clears throat> so the reason we look forward to this resurrection, inheritance, and salvation is God's word. Second is the person and work of Jesus Christ. Jesus came. He became a person, a human. He, he was born as a baby. He took on human flesh. God became man, the God-man. And he walked among us. And we have seen his glory. And he lived a perfect life and then died on the cross. So the person and work of Jesus Christ is also evidence of the hope that we have in the resurrection, in our inheritance, and in our salvation. And we have the confirmation of the gospel by the Holy Spirit. It says that we know these things because men preach the gospel by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit confirms within our hearts the truth of God's word and instructs us and guides us and leads us. So that's great. I mean, that's what we hope for. That's the basis we're hoping for it. But how do we do it? Because we still are here in this life. We're still, still here in this world. And, you know, your team loses and you lose hope. You, you lose money. You have some catastrophe. And you may lose all your fortune, all of your standing. You, you may lose family members. You may have a rift and find yourself without the security of the ones that you thought you had behind you. Well, how do we continue this hope? 1 Peter 13 does a little bit of the, the how and the what we're supposed to be doing. It says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action, being sober-minded, set your hopes fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in your conduct. Since it's written, you should be holy, for I am holy. Then he says, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but you were bought with the precious blood of Christ. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world. How are we to continue in hope? First, prepare your mind. Peter says to prepare your mind. And what he gives you a few things. First, he says, be sober minded. Sober minded means your mind's not controlled by anything else, it's not controlled by any other substance. You're sober minded. Minded. It's not controlled by any social media. It's not wrapped up in something that you are continually being swayed by. You are sober minded. You know, we can fill our minds with so much junk. And if we're not careful, we can we can let the world and the world system take our minds off of the things of God, off of things of Christ. And he says, first, prepare your mind. What are you filling your mind with? Are, are you filling your mind with God's word? 
Are you filling your mind with just really garbage from the world? I got a text, this an email this morning. It's my weekly update from a newspaper. And I just started reading it. And I said, this is like the antithesis of my sermon today on hope. Everything was, it's bad, it's getting worse, this is worse, there's a new variant, and the whole world's going to crumble, everything's going bad, this person lost this, this is that, this, this country's going down, this, is in, this trouble's going on here and there and there. It was just a, just a list, a laundry list of why we don't have hope in the world. Now, if you are continually filling your mind with this and you're watching TV and you're getting the internet and you're, all you're doing is reading about all of this, you can't be sober-minded. Your mind's not prepared to hope in the Lord. You have to choose to set your hope on God's grace. And he, said, he says, don't follow the passions of your former times of ignorance. In other words, when you were a non-believer, you filled your mind with all kinds of things. You had passions and fears and worries about all of these things. Don't follow those passions. It starts with our mind. What we open our mind up to, what we fill our mind with, impacts the extent that we have hope in the resurrection and the inheritance and salvation that God says we have. Now, I know many of you probably read something daily, have a devotional plan, or you do something. You know, I can think of nothing better to do than, than to start your mind off fresh with God's Word in the morning. Because you can get up in the morning and check your email. You could check your text. You could check a blog. You could turn the TV on. You could turn the radio on. You could listen to news. <clears throat> but I think the best thing that we can do is to prepare our minds. And that starts in the morning. Prepare your minds by opening God's Word. Be sober-minded. Set your hope on God's grace. How do we do that? We remind ourselves of the story of grace. We can't do that if we're focused on something that is against God's word. We can't do that if we are consumed by the world's you know, statements and blogs and, and emails and texts, <clears throat> news feeds. Now, there's a place for knowing what's going on in the world and, and for having an awareness of the things that are going on. But we sure, sure can be consumed by things that do not help us choose to set our hope on God's grace and that are not allowing us to be sober-minded. So start your day. Be sober-minded. That means not influenced by anything else. Of course, drugs, alcohol, those kinds of things. But beyond that, other influences, other voices, other, other things. Second, he says, be holy in your conduct. <clears throat> be holy in your conduct. Now, sin can disappoint. I take that back. Sin does disappoint. And it's hard to prepare your mind for hope when you're practicing sin and being separated from a God who is holy. So he says, you want to be hopeful? You want to have hope? Set your mind, first of all, prepare your mind. Second, be holy. And we do that in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we don't do that to earn our salvation. But we do that because we are saved, because we are God's people. He is holy, so we want to be like him. So we attain to the holiness that he has through the power of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Third, Peter reminds us that you were bought by a precious, perfect planned sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Remember the sacrifice of Christ. It was precious. It's not just like gold and silver, something you could buy. It is priceless. It's costly. You know, when they made a sacrifice, they weren't allowed to take a lamb that was damaged and defective that they really couldn't eat or sell and just say, yeah, we just give that to to the, to the priest. No. It had to be a lamb without blemish. Perfect. Even they had age limits. And they said, you know, two to three years old was a time that they were fully mature, but yet in the prime of their health. 
And that's what that's ideally what they would get, a perfect, unblemished lamb. And that's what Paul, Peter says, Christ was the perfect lamb. God and man, the God-man, perfect and holy. And he was killed on the cross. It cost the father his son, a precious gift. And he's perfect. He was without sin. And third, it was planned. He says that he was foreknown before the foundation of the earth. It says in verse 20, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for our sake. It wasn't a last minute, oh my goodness, what do we do? Sin came into the world. What are we going to do? What's, what are we going to do? Backpedaling. Throw up a desperation pass last second of the game because you're down by two touchdowns. No, that was not what God did with Christ. It was foreknown. It was planned. It was all part of his plan. We need to prepare our mind, be sober-minded, choose to set our hope on God's grace, not follow the passions that we had as a non-believer, be holy in our conduct, and remember this perfect, precious, and planned sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it says in the last verse, um, we are to trust that our faith and hope are in God so that our faith and hope are in God. We need to trust in God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Who do we put our hope in? In God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I don't know if you're discouraged today. I don't know if you find yourself a little bit down, or maybe a lot of bit down. Maybe very down. Maybe you can identify with somebody that's crashed your hopes or discouraged you. Maybe Thanksgiving wasn't what you hoped it would be. I want to encourage you, you can have hope today. You do have hope today. Hope that will give you an inheritance in heaven and peace now. Hope in the resurrection that you will have life again. That you will have a position in the kingdom. Salvation that will be fully orbed and fully mature when Christ comes again. Forgiveness of your sins. Peace with God. Eternal salvation for your soul. But also peace right now. Here, the Holy Spirit living in you. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior and tasted of the hope of that salvation. You can do that today. And I'd love to talk with you about how to become a Christian or how to take that and understand what God did through Jesus. If you are a Christian today, I want to remind you the precious, perfect, planned sacrifice of Jesus Christ who died for you. Prepare your minds on the hope of the grace of Jesus Christ that saved you and he will sustain you until he returns one day. And as Christmas approaches, I want you to be a person of hope. You hear a lot of despair around us right now because of COVID, because of the economy, because of the dichotomy, because of the, the division in our country. So much despair and negativity. Be a voice of hope and share with people the hope that you have, hope of the resurrection. Hope of your inheritance. Hope of salvation. That is guaranteed by God's word on the basis of the trustworthiness of God's word. The person of Jesus Christ, who he is. Put your trust in God. Be sober-minded. Trust in him. May you remember Jesus' sacrifice, his resurrection, and look forward with great expectation to his coming again which is our hope.